Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Cindy Hackett. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the Tahoma Unitarian Universalist Congregation. As we begin gathering this morning, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I speak to you today from occupied Puyallup ancestral land. I pay respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants who are still living, loving, and working on that land today and to all indigenous people. We welcome all who are joining us with a longing for community, the hope for peace, and who are seeking justice. I love seeing a couple new names. Welcome Teresa and anyone else who is new today. Um, we're so glad you've joined us. We are a diverse congregation and we encourage each one who comes through our doors or in this case, into our screen to find their own truth and belief. We invite all to join us in a search for meaning and community guided by reason, respect for each other and by love. One of the wonderful things about this virtual platform is that we have the opportunity to welcome guests outside our from outside our traditional geographical area. And speaking personally, one of the wonderful things I find is that I don't think Dave and I have been late for church since we started meeting virtually. Somehow there's just a magic about going to the screen that is different than driving across the bridge and finding parking and being late. So that's another benefit. It doesn't, however, um, I still miss seeing everybody's faces and I miss singing and I miss just the hubbub of being together in our sanctuary. So we're looking forward to that again. So a special welcome, as I said, to new friends and our returning friends from near and far away. I'd like to invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Links to the video version of this service will be posted there this week, as well as on our website. And this gives you the opportunity and me the opportunity to revisit pieces of this um, morning experience that you found especially meaningful. You might need that lift during the week. You can find all of our program announcements this week in our e-news, and listed on our church calendar. And here are some highlights for the week. After service today at 1130, children and their parents are invited to Kids Chapel with Nancy Slocum, our Director of Religious Exploration for Children and Youth. Next Sunday, June 6th, following worship service, our treasurer, Jeff Rufford, will host a session to review the budget that will present, be presented at the congregational meeting on June 13th. Details about this meeting will be posted this week on the church calendar. On your screen, you will see a delightful photo of the Grandeur Rood family, Rochelle, Eli, and Olive. And we're sharing this to remind you to send us a photo of you with flowers or plants for a video we're creating for the flower service on Sunday, June 6th. Please send your photo by Wednesday, June 2nd. You can find the email for this in the chat. And I'll just say personally that our photo looked nothing like that. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to find the most amazing blooming tree that you have ever seen. Um, you can be in weeds. We just really want to see your faces. We want to be able to connect visually with you. Again, links for all our programs can be found in the weekly e-news or via the events on our church calendar. We want to thank you for your, not only for your emotional support and your presence during this last umpty ump month, but also for your ongoing financial support. That makes all of this possible. The programs, our staff who create and facilitate the programs 
and the connections that we make through our congregation. So now, let us prepare to gather in worship. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together this morning. Our opening words are from Kim Beach. Everything begins on the verge of awareness. The dawn is not, and then it is. Sleep is not, and then it is. The passage of thin light between breaks open the day. The passage of thin sound between flows into the day. Too soon the numbing rumble of traffic swells and the day glares. Let the soft haze hang again across the row of the morning. Wait upon the narrow moment, the first awareness of being in between. Live days and seasons on the thin edge of dawn in praise of every single thing that begins now. It is so good to be together this morning. We now come to the beginning of our service where we light our chalice. You will see the words in our chat as Nancy lights it. We light this chalice in deep respect for the mystery and the holiness of life in honor and gratitude for those that have gone before with love and compassion for those who dwell among us and with hope and faith for the generations to come. Good morning. Good morning on this beautiful, sunny day, a lovely Memorial Day weekend. Um, this is uh, our time for all ages. My name is Nancy Slocum. I am the Director of Religious Exploration for Children and Youth here at Tahoma Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And I invite everyone, children and adults alike, to sit close and listen to this story that I have to share today. So this is a story, perhaps you've heard it before. Um, we talk sometimes about how it is good to hear stories more than once. So if you've heard this before, listen to it again today because you might get some new bit of learning out of it, some new information or some new appreciation for it. And this is the story of the blind men and the elephant. <clears throat> and my understanding is the story is uh, a folk tale from India, the country what is now India, but it's an old story that's been around for a very long time and it's been told in many different ways. And the version that I'm telling you today starts with six men who were all blind and they had never ever experienced an elephant. They didn't know what an elephant was. They had heard elephants but they had no idea what an elephant was like. And so somebody arranged to bring an elephant to them and they all gathered around the elephant. And because they were blind and couldn't see the elephant, all they could do was feel the elephant with their hands so that they could learn what it meant to be an elephant. Well, the first person uh, that, that reached up and felt the elephant was standing on the side of the elephant and felt this big wall, right? This big, massive side of the elephant. And indeed, he thought to himself, why, an elephant is like a wall. It's big and it's sturdy, and it just goes on for a really long time. It is a great big wall. Up towards the front of the elephant, another person was there, and he happened to grab onto the tusk of the elephant, those ivory tusks that come out from their face and he felt the tusk and he thought to himself as he as he touched the pointed end of it like oh my gosh an elephant is like a spear it's like a spear that's what an elephant is around on the other side of the face someone was touching the trunk of the elephant and holding on to the trunk and the trunk was moving and it felt muscular and it felt strong and what do you think he thought it felt like? Yeah, he thought it felt like a snake. He knew snakes. He'd never met an elephant before, but he'd met snakes before. And he thought an elephant was very much like a snake. 
And then another person was reaching up high and felt the big ears of the elephant flapping in the breeze. And those ears were moving and the man could feel the, the cool air coming on him from the ears and thought, why, an elephant is like a fan. And yet another man was holding on to the knee of the elephant, the leg, the sturdy leg. His, arm, his hands were going around it and thought to himself, what do you think he thought? He thought, an elephant is like a tree. And then the one last man was standing behind the elephant and he reached up and he grabbed onto the elephant's tail and was feeling that tail and it was long and it was slender and it reminded him of a rope. He thought, well, an elephant is like a rope. Well, the thing is, they all shared their observations with each other. The elephant's like a wall, the elephant's like a spear, a snake, a fan, a tree, a rope. And they started arguing and arguing, and each was certain they were right. And they never explored further. They left that elephant each thinking their own thought about what an elephant was. And nobody quite had the story right, did they? Because an elephant is like a wall, but also has parts that are like a fan, or a snake, or a spear, or a tree, or a rope. And as they argued, they never came to consensus. They never asked each other questions. They never explored further and went away with just this funny little narrow view of what an elephant was. This is a reminder for us, isn't it, about when we experience something, when we, what we feel, what we observe, what we sense might only be part of the story. Had those men talked to one another and shared each other's experiences, we might have had a better picture of what the elephant really was like. We need to make sure we're checking always to get the whole picture, know the whole story. That's our time for all ages this morning. I send you out with the words we use to sing you out of the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. We hold you in our love as you go as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go to nurture the spark of your precious life. We hold you in our love as you go. Thank you. Be well. We now come to the time when we ask for an offering of your financial support to help TUUC be there for us all. Thank you for your consideration to support our church during this unprecedented time apart. You may follow the link that you see on the screen or the one that has been put in the chat. Your donation, your contribution, your support for our church members and staff who continue to work tire tirelessly to keep us all connected and to continue to have the resources available that we need. Every little bit helps while we're physically apart, our gifts are stronger together. Thank you for your support. Now we do the dedication of our offering. You will also find that in the chat. We dedicate ourselves and our offerings to the work of this congregation, weaving a tapestry of love we call community, both within and beyond these walls. It is time for us to pause and to reflect, to take some space for stillness and reflection, for meditation, for prayer, whatever most suits you. I offer this brief meditation by my colleague, Leslie Takahashi. They teach us to read in black and white. The truth is this, the rest is false. You are whole or broken. Who you love is acceptable or not. 
but life tells its truth in many hues. We are taught to think in either or, to believe the teachings of Jesus or Buddha, to believe in human potential or a power beyond a single will. I am broken or I am powerful. Life embraces multiple truths, speaks of both and of and. But we are taught to see in absolutes, good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight. Let us see the fractions, the spectrum, the margins. Let us open our hearts to the complexity of our worlds. Let us make our lives sanctuaries to nurture our many identities. The day is coming when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than monochrome, that a river of identities can ebb and flow over the static, stubborn rocks in its course, and that the margins hold the center. Let us pause for a few moments of stillness. So may it be, amen. Our reading this morning is an excerpt from the Discorded Cosmos a journey into the dark matter, space-time, and dreams, deferred by Chanda Prescott-Weinstein. Prescott-Weinstein notes that there are, quote, few white women, few Asian people, few black people, few Latin people, and among those almost uniformly men, and no indigenous North American people. No past non-binary people are known to the historical record, unquote. She then comments, quote, I have no love for how my professional community is structured, but it's also the case that when I think about quarks, I experience the kind of loving hope that is best set to defefs black in, into the future. We know that we're going because we know where we came from. Maybe then I'm not just a hack for colonial science, but more like a Princess Surrey from Black Panther, giving particle physics a new spin and rhythm. This is not to say that the laws of the universe are not universal, but it may be what we think we know is incomplete and will not be complete until we are able to think beyond how white men are trained to think in a Western educational system. Only time and a community that does not have extensive barriers to the participation of people from a broad cross section of humanity will be able to tell how our understanding of physics will change when our understanding of who can be a physicist can change. I am one of the first to confront and to put in quantum terms, tunnel through the barrier made out of the belief that it doesn't matter if black women, people are excluded or if parts of the universe are described by colored physics forever marking this world as physics developed by and for white thinkers. A few months ago, I mentioned uh, having listened to a conversation between a favorite author of mine, uh, Kise Lehman, author of Heavy, um, and Chanda Prescott-Weinstein. 
they are two black academics, Lehman, who teaches writing in Mississippi and Prescott Weinstein, who teaches physics. Her specialty is particles and cosmology. I was especially struck way back when, um, way back when I, I listened to it by a comment made by Dr. Prescott Weinstein about how the nature of certain particles is taught in most physics classes. Now, I wouldn't know anything about this. The sciences are not my specialty as you may have guessed by the fact that I'm in ministry. But she said in this, this uh, conversation they were having, she said something like, everyone will tell you that you won't be able to understand this, but certain particles are both uh, a particle and a wave. She then reflected upon how for some people, notably non-binary people, it wouldn't be hard to understand. In fact, it might be very easily understood. I was hooked. And so before the webinar was over, I had ordered her book and I looked forward to reading it as soon as it arrived. Now, I have to admit, that my eyes glazed over a lot more than I expected them to. Her joyous dive into her particular area of study left my head hurting. The math and the quarks and the protons and the way models are constructed and all of that is so far out of my range of experience that I have a hard time slogging through it, I have to tell you. Yet I persisted and was rewarded. Prescott Weinstein describes the Western development of how we understand our universe. She says that for two millennia, it was seen, the universe was seen as spherical in Egypt and in Persia and Greece and in Europe. Grounded in the geometry of Euclid, our common understanding today is Newton's description that arises from calculus. Now, I suspect that some of you already know that geometry is concerned with straight lines and that calculus describes curved lines. I didn't know that until I read this book. I didn't take calculus or, ge I took geometry, but not calculus. And my geometry teacher honestly believed women had no reason to be in geometry class. So he kind of ignored those of us who were female in high school. Anyhow. Everything Prescott Weinstein tells us comes back to Euclid's geometry because they say it is the most intuitive way to look at the world. But it seems that what's intuitive is actually culturally based, not universal. She tells us the Pakir Palikur, sorry, Palikur people of the Amazon see it differently. Their geometric system, which is more accurately described, which more accurately describes the movement of the stars across the night sky um, than the Euclidean one, the pericar system seems to train the mind to think in terms of curves from the very start, rather than using straight lines as a jumping off point to curves. Their intuition is that the world, the universe, all of the, what exists is, is curved rather than in straight lines as our physics assumes. Now, I don't quite understand the impact of that different uh, approach and, and how it affects uh, our ways of being and operating in the world. But I do know that our assumptions and what we think of as intuitive changes our experience of the world. I mean, what if squares weren't the fundamental shape, but circles were? A more clear example of this um, comes in the distinction of how we view time. Time in the Western view is linear. It moves in one direction and that is always forward but we also know that time is cyclical. The year cycling through the seasons, the monthly circling of menstruation for those who experience it, all of that points to something repetitive rather than the relentless forward motion of time. Prescott Weinstein notes, 
which sense of time is the correct one? The one that marches forward and never repeats, which seems to be organized around the universal guarantee of decay? Or the one that centers and recognizes repetition? I wonder how the world would be different if we who were raised in the Western, this Western culture felt the cycles more deeply, if that was where we were centered rather than on the decay. What is intuitive for us? For who is it intuitive? What has our white colonial capitalist culture taught us that we don't even know we've been taught? And it's not just those malleable things like manners and what constitutes art, but any human enterprise is threaded through with ideas and beliefs which are grounded in human created, created ideas of what the world is like and how it is shaped, science included. Now here's an example. Here's an example of how our intuitions can lead us astray and how we can move away from it. A couple of years ago, I took a course on trans inclusion for religious professionals. And I am so grateful for the leadership of two trans folk, uh, Michael and Alex, and for their clear thinking and helpful teaching. One of the first things we did in the course was we talked about gender and how it is formed. The first thing to do, um, the first thing that we had to do was to deconstruct what everybody knows about gender. In every class I ever took about biology and especially human biology, we were taught that there were two sexes, male and female. They were defined by their chromosomes, right? You all know this, females were XX and males were XY. Lesson over, right? Biology is biology after all. But in this course, we explore the dimensions of identity that are formed from three separate factors. Um, biology, expression, and identity. From the very start, there's a complication for what we think we know. In all those teachings, I never learned about the possibility of being intersex, that some people are born with both male and female genitalia, and um, some are born with ambiguous genitalia. Now, I knew this existed. My mother, years and years ago, I think it was probably the early 1980s, uh, was taking a course on sexuality for young children. And um, one of the things she talked about was um, studies that were done on uh, around children who were born with ambiguous gender identity so that their genitals were not, I didn't think I'd ever talk about genitals in a Sunday service, but here we are, um, just struck me. Um, anyhow, they, um, when people were born with ambiguous um, or duplicated uh, genitals, um, they would talk about it as the deformity. She talked to me about it, about the deformity of being intersex, though she didn't use that word. Um, but I thought of it and she described it as a small rare thing that was corrected by surgery um, when the baby was very young. This is, you know, a while ago. Um, simple awareness though, what I learned from my colleagues is that there is not a simple genetic binary for sex. You can be born with a range of X and Y markers um, rather than just the two that we were told, we were taught again and again, define what sex was. And that was a revelation to me. I didn't realize that until a couple of years ago. It's not as easy as it seems. It's not an either or, it's not this or that. It's much more complicated. It's not as, it's not as easy to understand what is intuitive. 
The second dimension that they talked about was expression. How do you live into that gender that you were assigned at birth? Um, I think of men I know, including my father, who delighted in soft flowing feminine clothes and makeup, who are emotionally adept, who manifest those qualities that we think of as feminine. And I think of the women I know who love working on cars and enjoy carpentry and who would much be much prefer getting out and doing something challenging and physical rather than sitting and talking and drinking tea, which personally I would probably be more apt to do. Those, those women we know who present as more masculine. We all know folks. We all know folks who don't fit into those gender binaries. And then the third dimension that we talked about was identity which is how we understand ourselves. Some of us, like me, feel comfortable in those identities that are prescribed by the culture. I'm comfortable thinking about myself as female, using the pronouns she and her, being identified as such. I am one of those people who fit comfortably into that identity. And I'm so grateful for the people who have helped me to see that it isn't so clear cut, it isn't so intuitive, that it's much more complicated, that even the science around it has changed with time. Who we are is the interweaving of those three dimensions, all of us. Who we are is not now, nor has it ever been, a matter of a simple binary, no matter what your high school teacher, your college professor told you. And as we are in this time of crisis in our world, and especially in the ecological disaster that we are living in and toward, it matters that we are engaged in fully articulating and living into a complexity and its consequences for the world. Prescott Weinstein, as a particle physicist and cosmologist whose work can feel disconnected from the work of saving each other and saving this world, says this. I do know that science means nothing if it simply decorates the dinner table of power that holds it hostage. I have a responsibility to refuse to assimilate into a scientific culture that assumes white supremacy, capitalism, colonialism, and militarism are simply the cost of doing business. I also know that we are approaching the end of the world. And if we are to salvage life as we know it, as we understand it, and to work to avoid repeating the sequence of events that has led us here, we will need a new way of thinking and a new way of being in relationship. I'm missing my last page, friends. We're gonna have to wing it. Life is complicated. This is all so complicated. And we are called to be learners and doers of something new, especially in this time emerging from this pandemic, especially now. This isn't an easy time to be alive. I kind of doubt that any time really has ever been easy to be alive, but this seems particularly fraught and dangerous right now. We are day on day invited to dig deep into what we believe and what we assume and to leave with those beliefs and assumptions held lightly that we may be able with one another to see and help to create a new world that is more fair and free, that has a future that we can live into. Let us take that up 
and move forward, loving the complexity, understanding more, and changing the future. So may it be. Amen. I invite you now to pause again and take a few breaths. If there's something this morning that has touched you, I invite you to set an intention for how you take it out into the world with you this week. So may it be. Amen. Our closing words by Kelly Weissman as Proof Jackson adapted. Let us go out to share ourselves with the world. May its promises and complexity set our minds ablaze. May we hold fast to what life has taught us. May we question everything. And when we have changed the world and the world has changed us, let us return again to each other to share what we have learned. Amen. We now come to the end of our service when we extinguish our chalice. And as Nancy does that, the words are in the chat. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our closing song will be sung today by Patrick McPhee. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and by this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and by this we 